Cleft Rock by Wanda McAvoy. Chapter 1. Cogan Station, Pennsylvania, April 1961. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. Matthew 19, 16 and 17. Jack Kilgus shifted his 1941 Chevy truck into second gear as he headed out onto the road. It had been a long day, and he was ready to be home. He wondered what Jill would be having for supper and hoped it was not one of those casseroles she'd been trying. He tried not to be picky, but he was a meat and potato guy. She had been so excited about the last one. Chicken a la King said they could really save money because of using Left's meat. I want to cut my own meat and let it all get mixed up together after I swallow it, not before. He sighed. Money was tight, but it had always been that way as long as he could remember, except in the army. Three meals a day for which you didn't pay, Jack sang as he sat at the red light. He loved that movie, White Christmas, even though he'd never admit it to his wife. Bing Crosby's war. World War II had produced heroes. But the Korean War, his war, well, he never talked about it, unlike some of the fellows he had served alongside. The sooner I can forget it, the better. At least the nightmares had slowed down. He hated scaring Joe with them, waking up to see her face so full of pity. As he turned into their driveway, his heart swelled with pride. It wasn't much, but it was theirs. Or at least it would be some day. Jack's growing up years had been filled with memories, sitting in the back of his dad's old Model A truck, loaded with their meager belongings, and pulling away from what had tried to be home, only to move into another rental property. Just about the time a place started to feel like home, they'd move again. He wasn't going to let that happen to his girls. Jack parked the truck by the house and grabbed his lunchbox and thermos from off the seat. Sometimes dark-haired Cynthia and tow-headed Karen would be waiting at the door, but most times they were still napping. He knew that Joe purposely had them nap later so they could enjoy some alone time. But it didn't always work. Not that the girls were rowdy. Generally speaking, they were as good as gold, especially when he thought of his own childhood. But then, he had grown up with three brothers and only one older sister. Oh, how he loved his girls. He knew Joe wondered if he hadn't wished for a boy. He didn't quite know how to express his thoughts, only that boys didn't get drafted. Jill had hoped the girls would sleep a little longer. She had spent extra time fussing with her hair, changing out of the day's work clothes and putting on a clean skirt and blouse, one of Jack's favorites, although lately he had been favoring the shorts she had sewn on her old Singer treadle sewing machine. Spring was just around the corner, but today had been a hot one for April. Jack never complained, but she knew it got hot in Avco, the Lycoming engine plant in town. She was just putting on fresh lipsticks when she heard him pull up the drive. She hurried to finish, pressed her lips onto a tissue, and headed downstairs. Just as Jack opened the screen door, she stepped off the last step and met him in the kitchen. Her efforts had been worth it. Jack's face brightened when he saw she was wearing his favorite outfit. He didn't deserve her. Certainly her father had thought so, too, at first. But Jack had a way with people. His honest face and sincere heart shone through all he did. It wasn't long before Jack and Gary Preston, Jill's father, were hunting together and working hard to make improvements on the house. Jack was good with a hammer, but Gary was a carpenter by trade and knew how to do things right. Jack had always found it easy to talk with Jill's dad. In some ways, the man was more of a father to him than his own dad. He still remembered the day he had asked the man for his daughter's hand in marriage. It had been one of the hardest things he'd ever done. I only have one concern, and I think you know what it is, Mr. Preston had said in his quiet, confident voice. Jack knew what he was going to say. With heartfelt empathy, Gary continued. Are you a believer, Jack? At the time, Jack wasn't sure what he had meant. Yes, sir, Jack had assured the man, and he did believe. Who wouldn't after facing the gooks? 
But now that he had been married to Jill for nearly seven years, he realized their meaning of belief was different than his. Jack hurried to put his thermos and lunchbox by the sink and came to scoop her up. Even after giving birth to two children, her waist was still petite, and he easily swung her up and around. Jill loved the scent of the machines on his clothes. It reminded her how hard he worked to keep his little family clothed and fed. He kissed her long and hard. It was Friday, and both were glad. She led him to the side porch, grabbing two bottles of cola and the bottle opener on the way. How was your day? she asked as they both sat on the porch swing. Jill had taken advantage of the warm weather this week and had surprised Jack by having the porch all cleaned and swept and furnished. It was their favorite spot on the property. From it, they could look down over the front yard as well to the side pasture, fields, and orchard beyond. No one could see them, and they saw no one except for an occasional vehicle down on the road in front of the house. It had once been the main highway and Jill could recall traveling it as a child on her way to her grandparents' house. She had always admired the place, and at times it didn't seem real that she now lived here. Jack put his arm around her and nuzzled her neck, causing her to giggle. It just got a whole lot better. Jack, she reprimanded, as he started to kiss her once again. Hmm? was his response. He knew she was ticklish in that particular spot, but stopped before she got angry. Seven years of marriage had taught him a few things. Jack popped the lids of the two bottles and handed one to Jill. He sat up and took a long sip of the cool drink before laying his head on the back of the swing. A cow bawled from the barn behind them and Jack sighed. Blackie's wondering where her supper is. Jill laid her head on his shoulder. She won't starve, although she sounds like it. She turned her head to kiss him on the cheek. Jack savored the moment of peace and tranquility. His heart was heavy with sad news. He had to tell her, but he didn't want to spoil the moment. The boss came around today, he said quietly. He could feel her body stiffen. He laid three of us off. Jill sat up. Oh, Jack, I'm sorry. It wasn't anything they hadn't faced before. Jack loved his job, and he was good at it, but the company was in a tailspin. Since the Korean War had ended, the need for airplanes had greatly diminished. It seemed like every week someone was let go or laid off. So far, Jack had kept his job, but layoffs meant no income, even if it was only a month or two. Unemployment helped, but it was never enough. I'll find something. Don't worry. I'm not worried, Jack. It's just that you're such a good worker. It doesn't seem fair. It wouldn't be fair to lay off those who have been here longer, Jill. Some day, that will be me. Jill took the empty bottles and put them on the table next to the swing. She put her arms around Jack, and he pulled her onto his lap. Jill snuggled into his chest, enjoying the closeness, despite the heat. She knew God would take care of them. But did Jack? Jim said J.R. Construction is always looking for help. I'll give them a call tomorrow. Jack was an easygoing guy, but Jill worried enough for both of them. Perhaps it was the memories of her father's struggles as a carpenter that caused her to worry. Both Jack and Jill were born during the Great Depression, but neither were old enough to remember the food lines or businessmen selling apples. Williamsport, Pennsylvania had been spared such sights, being a smaller town with a large farming community. The sting of the collapsed economy was not as drastic there. However, Jill did have memories of her mother feeding hobos who had found their way from the railroad to their back porch. She often wondered where they had come from, and where they were going. Jack took her hand and squeezed. She seemed to be miles away, and he wanted to bring her back and assure her all would be well. It'll be all right. Aren't you the one with the great faith in God? he asked, with a look that bordered on a smirk. Her look made him wish he hadn't said it. They had given up talking religion long ago, although he knew she prayed for him every day. He was glad, but he didn't understand what all the fuss was about. Jill chose to let the statement drop and simply said, You're right. He will take care of us. He always has. Their eyes locked momentarily as though speaking the word truce. Jill smiled weakly, but it was enough of a signal to Jack that everything was right between them. As though on cue, two sleepy-eyed little girls pushed open the screen door and toddled the distance to them. 
When they saw that Daddy was home, smiles lit their faces, making Jack's heart flip. Jill slipped off his lap and made room for them to take her place. He scooped both up into his strong arms and set one on each leg. "'Well, isn't this a sight for sore eyes?' he said, as he tousled both heads of hair. The girls giggled and chattered, telling him about the new kittens that had been born in the garage. Jack's eyes went to Jill, and she nodded. "'But we didn't touch them, Daddy. Mommy said their mommy wouldn't take care of them if we did,' said Cynthia, her face a study of seriousness. They're so cute, Karen interjected. Can we keep them? Cynthia asked with pleading in her eyes. We'll see, Jack answered. A farm always had plenty of kittens, and the girls had been asking for one to keep in the house for quite a while. He had not grown up with animals in the house. Cats, like everything else in life, were only kept if they served a purpose, like keeping the rat population at bay in the barn. But as a pet, he didn't really mind but it would mean more mouths to feed. Jill watched his face, almost able to read his thoughts. She smiled, knowing that he would give in. For the next two months, Jack drove down Route 14 to the new construction site for Route 15. He actually enjoyed the time to be outside, and construction work suited him well. He was even able to work some overtime, which made for a long day, but the paychecks were nice. He hoped he would be able to put a down payment on a new truck soon. One late evening, after an especially long shift, a flash of light caught Jack's eyes as he turned off Route 14 onto their dirt road. Near the top of the mountain, behind their house, something reflected the rays from the setting sun. He squinted, trying to locate the glare. It seemed to come from the rock cliffs, which jutted out from the mountain top. Jack shrugged his shoulders and completely forgot about it until he saw it again the next two days. He knew the spot. It was one of his favorite hunting haunts. He often climbed there to the top of the mountain just to sit on a rock ledge. The view of the valley below was breathtaking. Peace and tranquility seemed to envelop the place. Perhaps he'd climb up there this weekend. He'd love to take his family, but it was a difficult climb, even for him. After greeting Jill and the girls, who were up from their naps, he meandered out to the barn. His thoughts returned to the flash of light he saw earlier. What could be up there, reflecting light, and why hadn't he seen it before? He traveled that road every day and had never seen it. Jackie and the other four cows were glad to see him. The steers in the first two stalls shook their massive heads, rattling their chains as if to say, Feed us first! Jack laughed. I see you boys, but you know girls always come first. He loved to farm, often wishing he could have farmed full-time, but buying farmland and the equipment to farm would cost a fortune. If only Dad had been wiser with his money. He shoved that thought away. His first task was always to open the water spigot and fill the barrel of water located in the stall area. The animals seemed to sense fresh water was on its way and dipped their muzzles in the watering bowls to get the first taste. Walking into the lower stall area, he went to the barrel to check for any leaks, tapping it to gauge how full it was. "'How are you doing, Blackie?' Jack asked as he scratched the heifer's head. Next week he hoped to put them out in the pasture, but some of the fencing needed mending. He would do that on Saturday morning. Then, in the afternoon, he'd plow the upper field and get them ready for planting. He filled each manger with a couple scoops of chop made from last year's corn and made sure the automatic watering bowls were working, clearing away any debris that might cause them to malfunction. They had been the best thing he'd ever bought, no more hauling water to each animal with a bucket. Taking the shovel from off the wall, he started mucking out each stall, tossing the manure out the window and onto the manure spreader. He whistled as he worked, enjoying the physical exercise. Jack smiled as he thought of Jill's admiration of his bulging muscles. She was a city girl and it hadn't taken much to make her notice his blonde hair, blue eyes, and strong physique. Filling each stall with fresh straw was Jack's favorite part of the daily duties. Climbing the ladder to the hayloft, he pitched a bale of straw down through the opening and climbed back down. Picking up the bale, he deftly cut the twine with his pocket knife. The rich, sweet scent filled the air as he spread the straw around each animal with a pitchfork. Blackie was too busy eating to notice him until he gently poked her with a fork. Out of the way, Blackie, he said. With that task done, he walked outside and meandered around the barn, 
checking for anything out of place. He would need to be thinking about painting the barn soon. Always something, he murmured to himself. At least the corn crib was new. Gary and he had finished it last fall, right before the corn was ready. He walked over to it, admiring the bounty. It had been a good summer, and the crib was still nearly half full. In his mind, he calculated how much corn, oats, and hay he would need to plant to increase his herd. More steers meant more beef to sell, and more money. Cynthia and Karen were swinging on their swing set, pumping their little legs to go higher, and laughing about something. The sound made his heart ache with joy. You're making a place for yourself and your family. You're a good man, Jack, he said to himself. There is none good but one. The inner voice was so strong it made Jack stop in his tracks. Several years back, he had gone to church with Jill before the girls were born. He remembered the day and the sermon. Sure, the pastor was a nice enough guy, but he had made Jack feel small and insignificant. He remembered the Bible verse and wondered if the preacher was making it up. But when he questioned Jill, she had gone to her Bible and meekly showed it to him. It had made him mad and he hadn't been back since. He was a good guy. He worked hard, had fought for his country, risked his life. He was honest and didn't hang out at the bar. Jill had told him the verse was talking about Jesus. He knew that, that Jesus was a great man, but still, I'm not a bad man. One of these days, he'd give it another try, but this Sunday, he was meeting God on the top of the mountain. Sunday proved to be a beautiful day. Jill and the girls had left for church as Jack finished his coffee. Bye, Daddy, the girls chimed as Jill gave him a pleading look over their heads. It nearly did him in, and he knew his days were numbered. When the girls are older, I'll go to church. He certainly didn't want them to think he was a heathen. He might have even gone today, but he was a man on a mission. Jack finished his coffee and grabbed his hiking stick from the corner of the porch, used more for snakes than to aid his climb. He breathed in deeply as he walked, enjoying the fresh, crisp air. The usual April weather was back, and he was glad. He loved watching the trees begin to wear a bit of reddish hue as leaf buds began to spring forth. Now the trees were feathered with infant light green leaves, which laced the mountain with chartreuse beauty. A squirrel chattered from above, and Jack wondered if he was near her nest. The fallen leaves of last autumn made it nearly impossible to be quiet, but he did his best, and was rewarded with the sights of a deer, turkey, and grouse. By the time he reached the cliffs, he was breathing hard. Stopping right below the cliffs, he looked around for anything that would reflect light. Nothing. He climbed to the top of the cliffs, having to circle away from them before the ground was level enough to make the climb. Each step revealed more of the beautiful vista that awaited his approach. The sun was well on its way across the sky, and there was not a cloud in sight. Jack wiped the perspiration from his brow and slowed his breathing as his eyes scanned the view. He was not in a hurry and went to the edge to sit down. His thoughts went back to the phrase he couldn't seem to forget. There was none good but one. Jack's Bible knowledge was next to nil. Did he even believe in God? He looked up into the sky. J.F.K. had said they were going to put a man on the moon. He shook his head. Amazing. Can we really do that? Is God on the moon? He laughed at the thought. God is everywhere. He remembered a long-ago Sunday school teacher making that statement, and Jack never questioned it. He really wasn't questioning now. Of course he believed in God. He even believed that Jesus died on the cross. After all, it was a historical fact, wasn't it? Tired of thinking, he decided to look for anything that would reflect light. Maybe it was just a discarded piece of tin or something. He walked the entire expanse of the rock formation, looking over the edge, but he saw nothing. Shrugging his shoulders, he decided to take a little nap on the rock, which was now baked warm by the sun's rays. The heat felt good on his face as he lit a cigarette and gazed across the valley. The smoke felt good in his throat, and he began to relax. On a day like today, what really matters? Money? God? Church? He finished his smoke and ground out the butt soundly before tossing it over the edge. Laying back on the hard, warm surface, he was soon fast asleep. 
When Jack aroused, he was surprised to see that the sun had traveled so far across the sky. He looked at his watch. Eleven thirty! Not wanting to alarm Jill, he quickly rose and started back down the mountain. When he was halfway down, he turned and looked again, hoping to see a glimmer of reflection. But there was nothing. I went looking for whatever was reflecting the sun, Jack said casually as they readied for bed. He hadn't made it home before Jill and the girls, and Jill had been worried, although she covered it up with peevishness. It had been a long, quiet afternoon. After dinner, Jack read the paper while Jill and the girls washed the dishes. The air was thick, and even the girls' chatter could not break through. Jill read a book while the girls napped, and Jack watched an old war movie. Now he tried once again to get Jill to talk. Silence. He knew what he needed to do, apologize, if he wanted to get any sleep or anything else tonight. Look, he said with a tinge of anger in his voice, I'm sorry I was late and made you worry, but I fell asleep. Jill's back was to him as she hung her clothes in the closet. He waited until the task was complete, but she still did not face him. That's when he noticed that her drooping shoulders were shaking and her face was in her hands. Jack hated to see her cry. He had no defense against these womanly weapons. He walked over to where she stood and gently turned her around, pulling her into his arms. It wasn't like her to dissolve into tears like this. Goodness, he hadn't been that late. He stroked her hair. Hey there, what's this? He could feel the wetness of her tears on his chest. She sniffed and tried to gather her composure. It's just that... When you go into the woods alone like that, I just get scared something's going to happen to you. Ah, oh, Jill, is that all? He felt her stiffen. Jill had been raised in town, and the woods were a scary place to her. The unknown always is. She looked up at him with fiery, albeit moist eyes. Is that all? She repeated in a shrill whisper, not wanting to waken the girls. What would I do? No, what would we do? If you were attacked by a bear or a mountain lion, she huffed. A smile slowly came to Jack's face. Jill, you know there haven't been mountain lions in these parts for years, even if rumors still circulate about them. And a bear, well, a bear is smarter than to come after me, he joked. He saw the worry on her face and pulled her close, kissing her on the top of her head. He loved that she was nearly a foot shorter than he. Nothing's going to happen to me. You know I love the woods. Heck, I'm more comfortable in the woods than in L.L. Stearns. That brought a smile to her face. It was a private joke between them. Once, when they were first married, Jill had talked Jack into accompanying her to the store to buy a new dress. She hadn't given it a second thought until they walked through the lingerie section. Jack had turned beet red and swore he'd never go shopping again. The tension was gone. The air was fresh and clean like the atmosphere after a summer shower. I can take care of myself, he assured her. She looked at him, ready to give her a retort, but he beat her to it. And I know that you pray for me. Can't you trust God? Jo opened her mouth, shut it, and then opened it again. Jack tilted his head back and laughed, but Jo quieted him by placing her hand over his mouth. He looked chagrin, but took her hand and kissed it. He pulled her close and kissed her, sending messages of his heart's desire. Once again, Jill surrendered her husband to her God, body and soul. She knew he could not understand all her angst. Jack's message was received with a knowing smile. It was going to be a good night after all. Well, that's chapter one, and I'm not the greatest at reading, but I thought maybe it would help you to get my heart and get a flavor and a feel for Cleft Rock. I really enjoyed this book, and I hope that you will too. Just check it out, once again, at wandambackavoy.com, or just send me a message, text me, let me know that you're interested, and I'd be glad to get a copy to you.